Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined again by Professor John Marini to continue our series on American Masters, on John Ford's Westerns. We have already discussed The Searchers and Liberty Valance, Stagecoach, and now we are turning to My Darling Clementine, John Ford's first post-war Western of 1946. I am happy to let our audience know that the friends of the show now include Powerline and we would like to thank Steve Hayward and Scott Johnson over there who have recommended our podcasts and brought a whole new audience to the show. It's good to see that there are people really interested in the Westerns, in what they say about America, about human nature and about how poetry works. Sir, thank you for joining me again. I'm glad to see we're already on our fourth episode in this series. I know you're a great fan of John Ford and you know a lot about him. It was from you that I heard that John Ford actually met Wyatt Earp, the protagonist of My Darling Clementine. So we should start there. Sure. Yes, John Ford met Wyatt Earp right after around the end of the First World War. When Earp was married to a woman, I think, that was a religious woman, and every once in a while she'd go off to a retreat somewhere, and Wyatt would go down to Hollywood to visit some of his friends down there. And some of the friends that he knew in Hollywood that were working in films were friends of Ford. So, of course, Earp met Ford that way, and Ford talks about, uh, interestingly, the gunfight at the OK Corral was not so well known at that time in 1918 or whenever it was. And Ford had only heard of it from his friend, Harry Carey, who was also a friend of Wyatt Earp. So when Ford met Earp, he asked him about the gunfight at the OK Corral. And Ford claims that the way he filmed it was the way Earp explained it to him. And he said he just took a stick and he used a kind of military tactic to show what they did. And he recreated that in the movie. And if you watch the movie and you watch that gunfight, it's just very short, but you can see the way in which he, he sets it up. And he insists, of course, that that's the way Earp explained it to him. And of course, you know, Ford is one to take liberties with the whole broader question of this whole meaning of Wyatt Earp. His view of Earp and the way in which he uses him artistically in this movie is not historically accurate, as we well know. So many of the things Ford changes in the movie are changes that he thinks better reflect what he wants to present as part of the dilemma of America in the post-war period, at addressing these questions that had in some ways plagued America and Western civilization in the whole of the 20th century up to that point. After you had those great cataclysmic events of First and Second World Wars, the Depression, the great technological advance established by the atomic bomb, which didn't exactly put people at ease. Ford was addressing some of the anxiety and some of the potential for despair in the aftermath of the war, which had been America not so much destroyed, but so much of Europe destroyed in the war. And so this is a movie that's going to tell a different kind of story, I think. And it goes back in a way to the beginning. And it goes back and it links the problems that one finds in establishing community, how it is that law is established. In that, Ford looks to the fundamental human problem that exist in every kind of community. And in some ways, he does it simply. In fact, he himself, when he was explaining this movie in an article, and it's funny, he tended to explain himself intellectually better to popular magazines than he did to intellectual. (laughs) He gave an interview to a Cosmopolitan magazine in 1964, and he said, He says, we all want to leave the troubles of our civilized world behind us. We envy those who can live the most natural way of life with nature, bravely and simply. And in some ways, of course, he shows the difficulty of doing that and the ambiguity, really, that arises when you move away from that more simple or natural way of life because civilization itself creates its own problems. And in Ford, you always see not a progressive view of history because for every kind of advance that appears to be progress, there's always some drawback or something that you lose in that process. And so in My Darling Clementine, I think he's trying to recreate a way of thinking about this problem and establishing a ground of it, a moral ground of the understanding of community. 
what it takes, what it means. And I think what he shows that it takes in fundamental ways are friendship and love. Those are two things that establish the necessity of community and family and home and all of those kinds of things that are always themes in his West. So looking at the West, I think, as the way of reestablishing a moral connection with the founding, American founding, but also the foundations of Western civilization. Those foundations are laid in ways that establish meaning through philosophy, through religion, through poetry, through literature, through music. Every one of those things Ford incorporates in his art to elaborate these themes that he's developing. And of course, all the while having to make this also entertaining. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, John Ford was a great storyteller, mm -hmm. and that was part of what allowed him to recover the importance of making myths, of telling stories that persuade people there is something grand, but also intelligible in human affairs. And as you said, he came up in Hollywood when the Wild West, which was just closing down, after all, Arizona only became a state in 1912. Yeah. And that's Monument Valley and from the movie takes place, as do many other of his westerns. And heroes, legends of the Old West, like Wyatt Earp, were still alive and were part-time consultants on western movies in Hollywood. <laughs> which right. John Ford was an early director. He made lots of movies, now lost most of them unfortunately, silent movies in the mm. teens and twenties. For a man who was making movies in the 60s, he had started in 1917 or thereabouts. So yeah. he not only spans a great length of the history of Hollywood and of American movies, but also he was there to see the origins of it and he was there to meet people like Wyatt Earp and their common friend Harry Carey was a star in a bunch of his movies and his son was an actor in a lot of other John Ford movies. Harry Carey Jr. was. Right. And so you have this meeting of history and myth-making and poetry right there on the spot that proved to be a fertile ground for somebody with the genius of John Ford, who then brought yeah. all these greater resources of thoughtfulness and of artistry. Well, we forget that Ford went out to Hollywood because his brother, Francis Ford, was already there and had established himself. In fact, he was an owner of a studio. He was very successful. Ford goes out to Hollywood in 1913. 14. His brother was already there. The way the Hollywood system changed, Francis Ford, of course, fell on hard times about the time when Ford himself begins to resonate as a director. And that's after 1917, but certainly by, say, 1924 with the Iron Horse and some of those. Yeah. But Francis Ford is actually in a lot of these Westerns. In fact, he's in My Darling Clementine. Yes. So <laughs> it's an interesting thing. I mean, you could say that he was there. Ford went to Hollywood really almost right about the time when Hollywood was being established really as film capital. And Ford also then saw the possibilities later of not only the recreations that were possible in the studios that were created in Hollywood, which were pretty sophisticated sophisticated for those days, but also in the land itself. That's why Monument Valley becomes so important, because there he's using the land as itself as a symbol of the eternal, of the things that don't change. Just as he uses the desert in Liberty Valance as the things that don't change and the things that aren't man-made and the things of beauty in the desert like the cactus rose, all of those become kinds of symbols that reveal the tension between nature and civilization. When man, particularly when he tries to dominate nature, turn it to his own uses, there's some dangers to that too. Yeah. And so our story starts with Wyatt Earp and his brothers coming into Arizona on their way to California to sell their cattle. They don't mean to stay there to begin with, and Wyatt remarks on the harshness of the land. That's not mm. cattle country. And mm -hmm. initially wants to go beyond it, feed his cattle again, and eventually take them to market. So that would make the desert only a very temporary testing ground on the way to something else. Mm -hmm. The herbs are self-sufficient, they are cowboys, they own their herd, and they're in it for the commerce. 
they get their freedom yeah. on the road, but they make their living by commerce. They're not interested at first in civilization or in a community. And of course, there's not much community for them to be interested in. It takes accidents and tragedies to set this in motion. Mm. In a bit of poetic serendipity, the man who introduces Wyatt Earp to Arizona is uh, Clanton, played by the great three Oscar winning Walter Brennan in one of his rare roles as a really bad guy. Yeah. And this is the man and his boys, the Clantons, the other family, the conflict between the Earps and the Clantons being the center of the story. This is the man who wants to buy his cattle and then steals them and murders his brother. It's serendipitous that the two enemies meet at the beginning, just like they do again at the end for the final showdown, but also because they show two very different kinds of families. No, right. I think that's the key to establishing the political character of the movie is whether the conditions of a political regime established on the ground of a kind of equality among the brothers and the despotic rule of the Clantons, which is a pre-political kind of rule that is based on the whip and just brute force. But interestingly, you're right that the Earps are going to California. They're passing through. And Earp was from California, the Earp family. They were out toward Bakersfield. But you notice about the West, and I think Wallace Stegner noticed this a long time ago, that the Westerns were made in California. The Westerns really weren't about California. Yeah, in, exactly. in a certain way, the Westerns were always about people trying to get to California, exactly. but they always end up in exactly what we're looking at here. It's always in some godforsaken place. And of course, the promised land is oftentimes California, but California becomes kind of make-believe home of the West through the movies. So, yeah, it's an interesting thing, but when you look at the distinction that he makes between the Clanton family and the Earp family, he raises the whole question of how it is that political life is established, communal life that is compatible with civilization, with family, with all of the things that are required to perpetuate those institutions like the family. And so the themes that are crucial to me in the way in which I came to look at the movie were the themes of friendship, which is very unusually developed between Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. They're on different sides of the law in certain ways, and they're completely different characters. Doc Holliday is sophisticated. He's from the East. Ford distorts what he was as a doctor to surge. I guess in reality, Doc was a dentist. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the picture of Holiday in Boston, he's in a rowing team. He's probably gone to Harvard. He knows Shakespeare. He's not at home fully in the West, but in some ways he is at home in the West. He has more in common now with someone like Earp, somebody who can live in that environment than he does with those in the East, that world that he left. So he's not scornful of the West. He thinks there's something important to learn, Holiday, in the West about the resourcefulness and just the necessity of survival, of self-preservation. These things make it possible for these two seemingly different people to come together. They're both somewhat complex. And I think the thing that made me realize most clearly that Ford must have understood what he was doing is that character of Thorndike in the movie, the Shakespearean actor, the two things that he recites and recites pretty fully in a Western movie to see a great part of Hamlet's soliloquy to be or not to be and to present it the way Ford did in a very interesting way. I mean, that scene when Thorndike's trying to recite Hamlet and forgets, and then Doc Holliday fills in and establishes the words to the rest of, or part of the rest of the poem. Looking at those two things more fully gives you some idea of these characters in a much better way. I often thought, watching this movie over a number of years, and I talk about it in some of my lectures when I do it at the Publius, I came to think of this as, in a way, a certain kind of tribute that Ford made on behalf of Winston Churchill, and also on behalf of the alliance between Winston Churchill and FDR, the wartime alliance. When I figured out where these words came when Thorndike is leaving Tombstone and he says to the guy who's been escorting him around, and that's actually Francis Ford, he recites from Joseph Addison's poem, The Campaign. It's on the Battle of Blenheim, really, written in 1705. 
And I think it's important to just look at these lines. It gives you a good sense of why it is Earp and Doc Holliday represent, in the modern form of Ford's art, Sir John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, and the Prince of Savoy, Prince Eugene, a kind of friendship. I'll just read these lines that are quoted in the movie. Great souls by instinct to each other turn, demand alliance, and in friendship burn. A sudden friendship. Well, with stretched out rays, they meet each other, mingling blaze with blaze, polished in courts and hardened in the field, renowned for conquest and in counsel skilled, their courage dwells not in a troubled flood of mounting spirits and fermenting blood, lodged in the soul with virtue overruled, inflamed by reason and by reason cooled, in hours of peace, content to be unknown, and only in the field of battle shown to souls like these in mutual friendship joined, heaven dares entrust the cause of humankind. Now, you could say that this is precisely the relationship of Earp and Doc Holliday. It's a sudden friendship. It's only a matter of very short time, but in times and in hours in which you don't need these kinds, you don't know that you don't need them. But it's only when you're in these situations of extreme wars, of foundings, that it's to souls like these in mutual friendship join that heaven dares entrust the cause of humankind. That's Addison's poem. Of course, in reality, the historical thing that Addison's writing about, that's the war of the Spanish succession that actually led to the Battle of Blenheim, led to uh, Churchill becoming the Duke of Marlborough. This friendship and this role that Wyatt Earp plays in founding is absolutely essential to the transformation of Tombstone from what it was. And it's a community of sorts, but it doesn't have law. Several of the characters announce certain things that reveal the transformation occurring what is necessary to establish the town. There are four things that I think are fundamentally important. The first is um, utterance of Ike Clanton that's skeptical. When he finds out that Earp is going to be the marshal, he laughingly asked, marshaling in Tombstone. It was a joke to him. And it had been a joke. There was no real marshal in Tombstone. The next great utterance is when the actor comes and somebody exclaims, Shakespeare in Tombstone. First you have law introduced, then you have a form of culture or civilization in the form of literature and the things that are established beyond the particular, the things that establish the importance of meaning that are universal. And then you have church bells in tombstone, of course, religion. And finally, the force is when somebody says, oh, schools in tombstone. Those are the four things that I think reveal a transformation. And by the end of the film, you see that unlike the films later, certainly a film like Shane, when Wyatt faces the Clantons, he doesn't ask for, but he gets the support of both civil and religious authority. Yes. The deacon and the mayor are there to try to help him. Now, he doesn't want their technical help. In other words, he doesn't want them to fight because they're not fighters. But he does use them. This is, again, the kind of completeness that Ford establishes in this movie. Love, friendship, the things that are necessary to replace vengeance with justice are all themes explored in the movie. For Ford, there's always a great deal of ambiguity in these things. Because nothing is ever so clear that it just reveals itself and imposes itself as a kind of order. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Humans have to make choices. You're right that the sequence of the plot shows John Ford's intention throughout this fourfold development of civilization that starts with marshalling, which is a man's job, and gradually moves up until the end where it arrives at a school, which is a woman's job in the movie. It is the eponymous Clementine, who comes mm. also from the East in search of Doc Holliday, her fiancé, and ends up staying there in order to become a school teacher mm -hmm. and to bring civilization from the East in a way in which Doc Holliday had not brought it, although he was as much possessor of it as she is, but it wasn't in his character. And mm -hmm. so you see this gradual development, Tombstone thus becomes a, a civilized community, and it's throughout a complicated picture. To start with, the 
town is called Tombstone, and in the movie you actually do see one tombstone of James <laughs> Earp, the young brother who was murdered by the evil Clanton clan yeah. and you see that this was a necessary murder in some strange providential right. sense this is what forced yeah. Wyatt Earp to stick around in Tombstone and it brings, therefore but in a way, everything else possible it's an ironic thing because what it does the Tombstone brings the town to life Yes, exactly. <laughs> that shows you in a discreet way, but in a very powerful emotional way, when you see this boy and then he is murdered and he has to be avenged and you see the grief that this causes, you see yeah. that it takes sacrifice to that human lives in order to build something peaceful and decent. That great scene where Wyatt goes to his grave it's... and talks to him. You notice he has his character speak to the dead a lot. Yes, there's a great cemetery scene by the tombstone in young Mr. Lincoln as well, of course. Yeah, and in she wore a yellow ribbon when Nathan talks to his wife, who's dead. Uh, yes. There's lots of them. But we should say something about the title and the song of the movie, My Darling Clementine. <laughs> because, you know, that was a song that was written in the 1880s, and it had so many versions, but that was not an uplifting song. I mean, if you, you look at know. the whole You Are Lost and Gone Forever, Dreadful Sorry, Clementine, but in the initial one, she drowns by falling into a pit of brine, and her lover, he can't swim. Yeah. But when he gets to the very last line of that movie, Wyatt Earp, he says, I love that name, Clementine. And you'll note the farewell singing of that song is nothing to do with the lyrics of the original. It is, I'll be loving you forever, my darling Clementine. So there he's then established, again, the permanence and the things that are unchanging love, just as he does in so many of his movies. He always has a way of symbolizing nature, love, that are unchanging, which means that Ford never succumbed to the historicist or progressive understanding of the meaning of history. For him, it was always possible to go back, and it was always possible when going forward to get worse <laughs> than before. Yes. He's not a philosopher, but he's always grappling with the question of nature as a theoretical question. And exactly, there is a certain theoretical ambition here, as we see. After the meeting with the Clantons, Earp and the two of his brothers go to town to get a shave, become civilized. Yeah. This is important to the character of Wyatt Earp, just like later we see him dressed in a handsome suit with his hair done. Uh, the barber sprays some perfume on him. Yeah, uh, right. He, he does appreciate gentle things, just like we see with Clementine. Oh, He's yeah. very courteous with her, and uh, by the end of the story, she has won him over, actually. Well, he plans to come back once he's done with his cattle and yeah. settle with this woman. And so civilization wins the day in this sense, well, but you know, it takes a lot of getting there. In right. the beginning, he gets into town and he has cause to ask, quite so mm. practically, what kind of town is this? Because oh, of course. there's You're a always... drunkard discharging his six-shooters and nobody will stop him. There's mm. apparently no civil peace here, although they have sophisticated things like barber shops, or as the barber likes to call it, a tonsorial parlor. Mm -hmm. the... Don -ton. Exactly. They have well, French it... affectations, but they don't have the rule of law. Well, and... you could see the curiosity that Wyatt had about Doc when he watches him recite and listen to the Shakespearean actor. And you can see also, actually, Doc calls Wyatt his friend is when they're sitting in the... Remember, they're waiting for the marshal and Chihuahua, Doc's mistress, comes in. And, of course, he doesn't know that Wyatt had thrown her into one of the troughs of water, and she certainly was no friend of Wyatt's. But he introduces them, and he says, my friend Wyatt, er. And, of course, it takes a long time for that friendship to become evident. But there's clearly an attraction between those two characters that they don't really understand. They live in different worlds in some ways, but they're curious about each other's world and admire elements of both. Yeah. Doc admires that Wyatt is superior in the West, and Wyatt admires that Doc was superior in the East in the civilized world. And in a way, he had renounced it. And that's why there's the crucial part of the soliloquy, why you have to read the rest, what he left out, to realize what Ford is saying about the character of Doc Holliday. 
when the actor comes, of course, he's waylaid by the Clanton sons. And they say, don't you know anything but them poems? They don't like his reciting of it. And they try to stop him. And Wyatt and Doc come in. And, of course, Doc wants to hear the whole to be or not to be. That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind. To suffer. suffer. The slings, the slings and arrows of, of outrageous yeah. fortune. Yes. And he forgets. He stops, I believe, with the line that begins, but that dread of something after death, that's where Doc picks up. And he says, but that dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. And thus does conscience thus make cowards does of us all. conscience make cowards of us all. And that's where he stops. But then the last part of that is, and this explains Doc's character, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Doc's mind is paralyzed in a certain way. His irresolution, he doesn't understand it, but it's clearly that his disease, his tuberculosis, has made him incapable, really, of acting in, in the manner in which he had lived before. When Clementine comes to see him and wants him to go back, he says there's no vestige of that man left about the old Doc Holliday. And yet there clearly is all these things that he knew, but he can't act. Yeah, so he was a respected man, he was a successful man, and he was a man of science, not just of poetry as a doctor. Oh, right, right. But tuberculosis unmanned him. He was supposed to marry Clementine and live as a successful Yankee of some kind. But this immediate prospect of mortality, this incurable disease, turned his mind around. And he right, went out right. west, where he's a bank robber, he has a whore for a mistress, and mm. of course he gambles and drinks, although it'll kill him. He uh, tries to kill him. And even Clementine says, you're trying to kill yourself. And remember the scene where Wyatt hits him over the head. He's explicitly trying to goad somebody into having a gun battle. Uh, he becomes uh, fatalistic, as oh, of course, characters yeah. not infrequently do in John Ford. And this, of course, is something, again, straight out of Aristotle. Great men are given to melancholy, because there yeah, can never yeah. be a good adjustment between the merits of the person and the circumstances of life and of the city. Doc Holliday, at the peak of American scientific and civilizational progress, decided to go for the wild freedom of the West instead, and risk his life constantly to prove that he wasn't exactly a coward, although he was no, too no, coward in all. another sense to, yeah, right. to stay there but and marry this woman. And you can see in the woman a completely different kind of courage, very American. Yeah. She talks in one brief scene about her difficult journey finding Doc Holliday. Oh, of course. Now you think this would not be so hard because he's very famous, but it makes a point, as you were saying, that she went from camp to camp for six yeah, months. He's, but he's wandering too, right? He's yes. a wanderer. He keeps yes. moving. There's no place for him. And Another she thing. has the hardihood to survive out west as a pioneer wife would, so to speak. And she's right, looking yeah. to become a pioneer wife, but he can't do it. His encounter with death mm -hmm. has unmanned him in a certain way in which risking his life in battle or anything else doesn't scare him at all. That he form is of like the... Hamlet, and Wyatt Earp, unlike him, is like Horatio. He is far manlier in an ancient sense. He doesn't dwell on existential problems. In the famous scene where Wyatt and Doc rescue the actor Thorndike from mm -hmm. the Clantons who are about to beat him or kill him, yeah. uh, one of the Clanton boys pulls a gun on Wyatt and Wyatt just right. shoots him. You see this scene of great sadness, this actor who is being treated like dirt and who's a drunkard now and his <laughs> right. success is behind him. It's an incredibly affecting scene. And of course, there's Hamlet there too. And then White Earp just picks up his gun and shoots that guy in the hand who yeah. tries to pull a gun on him. White Earp is far more natural and far healthier oh. in all senses oh, yeah. of the word, not just with respect to tuberculosis. Right. And so their friendship is a lot like the friendship of Horatio and Hamlet. And in fact, you could say that this is a correction of Shakespeare. The problem with Hamlet is that Hamlet is prince and he's weak. Had Horatio been the prince, it would not have been a tragedy. <laughs> it would have been a success story. And in my darling Clementine, because it's the healthy, natural man, not the sickly, civilized man with the education, 
Hamlet, of yeah. course, like Doc Holliday, was a very educated man returning home from university when the tragedy starts. Yeah. So in oh, reversing oh, oh. the protagonists, you can work your way to a happy end while preserving quite a lot of the essential problematic of the tragedy. Well, yeah, but when you think about Doc in the environment of the West... He is a success, one of the most skillful and widely recognized gunfighters. Let's put it this way. In the East, he was a success on the grounds of civilization. In the West, he's a success on grounds of self-preservation. The problem with any of these things, including Shakespeare, when you reveal something and you reveal it in a certain way, yeah, you can create a resolution to that ambiguity poetically, but you can't do it realistically. You can't make it go away. Yeah. You notice the poker game when Herb talks about it's a game of chance. In a way, life is a game of chance, too. Yeah. Even that is not a progressive view. Yes. Because chance will always play a role. Yeah. So you, you can can't never take control of it through science. Right. All you can do is reveal the reality of the dilemma, whether it's Shakespeare doing it, whether it's Ford doing it. The only way you can make a good outcome of something that's inherently tragic is to make it comic. You can see that Ford is accomplishing many things here. When you think about, as I said, we looked at the music of My Darling Clementine, but you notice some of the other songs in there. You know that song, uh, 10,000 Cattle, in the movie that is sung by... Uh, Chihuahua? Uh, yeah, by Chihuahua. You know who wrote that song? No. Owen Wister, <laughs> the author of The Virginian the great friend of Teddy Roosevelt, the Harvard guy, he spent two years at the Paris Conservatory. That guy had written six operas. He was, in a way, the epitome of the civilized man, too. And he goes out to Wyoming, of course, writes the Virginian, which is surely a very important work in the history of how Westerns come to be understood in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Wister was, his family was so wealthy, he also got a law degree from Harvard, Wister, he didn't like law, but his father actually took him to visit Franz Liszt and had him play for Liszt because he played the piano. And he asked him, he said, because he wanted to know, he said, if you're not going to be good at it, you know, you just get out of it. And Liszt actually said, this guy has a lot of talent. But it didn't happen. But Ford tries to incorporate so many of these things into the music, the folklore, the heroes of that past that we long forget. And all of these are ways that I think establish for him the meaning of the past in an edifying way. Everything that Ford does in his art, no matter how bleak or how realistic, it's almost always edifying in the end. Yeah, he knows that you have to be able to live with what you learn. And, of course, that's the difference between Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. Doc can only redeem himself as a friend and as a gunfighter. Instead of being a doctor saving lives, he's turned gunfighter taking lives. Yeah, sure, but there is sure. room within freedom, at least, before the establishment of law for taking a life with justice. And yeah. that's what he learns. And well, as far as we know, when making Doc die at, at the OK Corral, he is actually making Doc die on the side of the law, on the defense of the law. Yes. Not as a gunfighter. It's clear that Doc had shot a lot of people, but it's not clear that he shot any of them in any just way. And I think a lot of the critics think that Ford establishes that gunfight in a way that makes it personal again. I don't think that's true. Earp tells the deacon this is a family affair, but he doesn't act that way. First of all, he has a warrant. Secondly, he tells Ike, submit yourself to the authority of law. And it's Ike that doesn't want to do it. And also, it's not strictly a family affair because Doc's involved. And the way they end the movie, critics see this through this lens of the progressive historian, that view of the cowboy as somebody that's just passing through, doesn't ever want to stay, and he can't stay because he can never be a part of the community. That's not true in this movie. It's, there's every reason to think he's going to come back. Yeah, and it's not just that, but time. most of the movie is taken up with showing how, in fact, Wyatt Earp fits in Tombstone, and the more of civilized he it gets, the more civilized he gets. And, and of that's course, part right. of a description of Western freedom. There's and you can a... see it in, I think, the Ward Bond character. When they start realizing some of the part of the community that's not either part of the gambling or the cattle empires, they're just decent people. 
in Stuart Lake's book that many of these things are based on, Stuart Lake had a quote, Earp himself, he says, he heard his father say many times that while the law might not be entirely just, it generally expressed the will of the decent folks who were trying to build up the country. And that until someone could offer a better safeguard for a man's rights, enforcement of the laws was the duty of every man who asked for its protection in any way. Yes. And so the decent folks of Tombstone, when Ward Bond has met a few, I think this is when the church is being built. Yes. He says, there's some nice folks here we could only get to know. Yep. You know, this whole thing takes place in a very short period of time. Yes. But that's very much the case, that the good people don't yet have the ability to maintain itself as a community before the herbs come. When you see that great scene, I mean, one of the great scenes in that movie, Erp walks Clementine up to the building of the church. And you know what they're playing when they do that, the song that he used, yes, Shall We the, Gather yes, at the River. At the river again. <laughs> yeah. You notice when Ford uses Shall We Gather, it's a river. It's, it's about always community. It's about community, but it's also about beginnings and ends. It's a judgment. Like at the mm -hmm. end of life, when you come to the river Styx, the Civil War song was about when we gather at the river after we die. But he also uses at beginnings, like weddings in the search. Yeah. Ends and beginnings, because that's the times when things are important, when judgments are going to be made. When you see that church rising, it's half built, it's got that American flag flying. <laughs> it's an amazing kind of scene that he creates there. And they didn't even know that it was going to be a church. Remember, when they're coming in, they have a debate among the herbs because they know church life. They were part of it. And they think this is a camp meeting. Yes. You know, if, you're, if you know anything about Protestant religion, you know that in places where there were no established churches, preachers would come and they'd have a camp for a little while. And, and yep. Deacon is insistent to say, this is not a camp. This is a church. Because they're going to build a community there. Right, it's not right. Just right. Oh, it's going to be a fundamental part of this community. And the deacon and the mayor are part of this community. That's civil and religious authority right there. They're Same. right there defending the law at the end, too. And that's why I don't think it is what many critics think it is, yeah. that this is just a personal dispute. No. John Ford is trying to say that there's no, strictly speaking, public reason to do justice. The justice always starts in our private lives because that's where we start. It is a family affair in that sense, just like in the book well, sure, you gave sure. that. Everybody, if they're under the protection of the law, they will have to also protect the law in some way. It affects people in their private capacity, not just in their public capacity. But no, that's this does true. establish and, but... a difference between people who risk their lives for good and deal and people mm. who don't. That's why in the movie it's only in the second half that we see the civilized people, not just mm -hmm. the townspeople that you were mentioning. But of course, Clementine Carter shows up. It is yeah. safe yeah. for her to show sure. up in a sense because yeah. Earp and his brothers are marshal and deputies now. And in that case, you see just how strong the connection between family and law is. His yeah. brothers are his deputies at the same right. time. And but that's... also, looking at that last scene, even though you have justice, the element of vengeance doesn't just simply receive. Vengeance is part of human nature. And so what yes. you see in that last scene there in the shooting script, in other words, the script as written, Clanton actually is not killed by Wyatt Earp. What Earp does is allow him to ride off, and that was a form of vengeance. But Ford changed it when he shot it. He showed that vengeance was not only dangerous to the community, it was dangerous to Wyatt Earp himself. What Earp was thinking was that there's a fate worse than death, and that's wandering. And he was going to let Ike Clanton wander and live his whole life out knowing his sons had been killed. And he thought that would be a greater punishment. But that's personal vengeance. That's not justice. And so when Ford does it, he shows the result of allowing a passion to overrule reason. And the rule of law. And of course, Verge saves him by shooting him when Clanton is going to kill him. That again shows that Ford's instincts, when they come to the fore, when he's filming these things, and he replaces what's in the shooting script. It's always an improvement. There's another element in the shooting script that was important. One of the crucial scenes in the movie is when a Chihuahua is shot and somebody's got to operate and Doc doesn't want to operate. I mean, he hasn't done it for a while. And in the shooting script, you know who initiates his doing it is Clementine. And here's the line that she utters in the script. You've got to do it, John. You've no alternative. Not only is her life at stake, yours is too. 
That's the line. He took that out. He takes the line away from Clementine, and he brings it back to friendship, to Wyatt. And Wyatt just says to him, you're a doctor, ain't you? Doc, you're going to operate. And he puts the onus on Doc because he's confident that Doc can live up to it. That's a much better way. I mean, that's a silly way of, in the script, really, isn't it? Yeah. You've got no alternative. Not only is her life at stake, yours is too. That's too obvious. Yes. Silly. Ford this just took that out. Yeah. He had a great sense for scripting. And a lot of the dialogue of Wyatt Earp was cut out because he didn't think Wyatt Earp should be a verbose guy. Oh, right. And also... When he speaks, it should count. You know the famous ending of the movie. Wyatt's heading back to California and he stops to say goodbye to Clementine. In Ford's version of the movie, he gets down and he shakes hands with Daryl Zanuck had a showing of that. You know how they did in the movies to yeah. a test audience. Preview. All the audience was upset that he didn't kiss her. Yeah. The original version of Ford's, you'll see the handshake. If you see it when he kisses her, you've seen the remake. I mean, Zanuck actually had Henry Fonda and Kathy Downs go back to film that scene, just that one scene, and do it as a kiss. Yeah, and uh, you can tell John Ford's version is 104 minutes. The theatrical version is shorter. It's 96 yeah. or 97, so they're easily identifiable. If you understood the characters of both Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp, he would have shook hands with him. He wouldn't have kissed him. Yeah. I mean, look, that was Doc's girl. Yes. I mean, that's almost like a mourning <laughs> for a little while until he comes back and, there, you know, things have changed. But also, you notice in the Zanuck version, you know, Ford likes music, but he didn't use music all the time. If you watch the Ford version, there's a lot less music than the Zanuck version. Yeah. Now, Zanuck, he's a good exec. They work together very well. So Zanuck thought he knew what audiences wanted. Ford thought he knew what had to be done. <laughs> And, of course, they clashed. But I remember Dan Ford said that he thought sometimes Zanuck actually improved John Ford's work because he did know how to make it appeal to an audience. From an entertainment point of view, that may be true. From a substantive point of view, I doubt that it's true. Yeah, it's hard to improve on just how much command Ford had of his cast of actors, of his scripts, of mm. his shooting, of everything else. The way he dealt with the studio system was by only shooting scenes he wanted in no, the movie. Right, right. So they couldn't... So they couldn't re-edit it <laughs> in whatever edit, way yeah. they wanted. And of course, he did very few takes. Yeah. This that movie put him is... in control. Yeah. I think this movie is one of the best Westerns ever made, too. This is a really complete and beautiful Western, beautifully filmed. I think I read somewhere that this was Peckinpah's favorite movie, Western. I did not uh, My Darling Clementine. I don't know if it's true. I mean, you read a lot of these things, mm -hmm. but I, I read that. I think it's a movie that, in its simplicity, establishes this story better than any way in which it was ever delivered again. No matter how they tried to do it, whether those newer versions like Tombstone or Wyatt Earp try to be more historically accurate, they never create a work of art of the same caliber. In a sense, it's impossible to do again. You can't capture the same combination of thoughtfulness, novelty, and a certain degree of fame. Wyatt yeah. Earp was already a legend. You don't get that chance twice. No, and he did recreate these people in heroic ways. I mean, yes. you know, the revisionists always point out, well, Herb, he was just himself a kind of a lawless guy. But that wasn't, again, Ford's point. Ford's point is art is about teaching. It's stories, too. These stories are important to the way people understand themselves as Homer was to the way the Greeks understood themselves. You have to have this. And from 46, probably to 1966, the Western was a force for establishing an identity of America's path with the good. It was not a way of corrupting the understanding of the past and the way in which the historians were frequently doing the revisionists, the inability to understand the fundamental problems that humans face in any time and how to make them intelligible in the time in which you live in a manner that's compatible with having a good life at the time in which you're living. You poison history and you're poisoning the time in which you live. John Ford was unique in his willingness to face the past in all its hardship and in all its tragedy and to understand it as livable and helpful for being human and living a decent life.
So yeah, we're not comparing Ford, him Ford. with academic authorities or other influential people who seem desperately trying to escape the past to reject. But you know, Ford anger never and... glossed over those things. When he made distinctions between nature and civilization, he didn't simply say that means civilization is good. Yep. And that he saw the flaws of civilization. He saw the difficulties of civilization. He saw the difficulties of perpetuating them. But you can't reveal these things and you can't understand them if you don't see what it is that transcends the particular time, the particular place. You therefore have to have the ability to understand the things that are permanent, the eternal thing. Yeah, John Ford is the alternative in movies to the view that the only possible good is in the future and that the past yeah. and present are unbearable. And that's, of course, very important today as it was 70 years ago. Yeah, we still confront this problem and we still have need of poetry to reveal that there's a lot yeah. of tragedy in human affairs simply because we're human and there's mm. no hope that it will all go away. But at the same time that within tragedy and within the hardship of moments of foundation, there is human greatness. That That's is the thing. Uh, yeah. action and well, sacrifice for a common good. So it's a combination of moderating an extreme anger at past injustice and on the other hand, an attempt to reveal human greatness as it truly is to give mm -hmm. people some hope. No, that's right. And one of the essays I wrote a long time ago that reveals what you're talking about in terms of the way progress is understood is Woodrow Wilson's The Idea of Progress. Remember that essay, What is Progress? Mm -hmm. He actually says the present and the past are nothing compared to the future. Yeah. I mean, that view is amazing. Yeah. It's literally unhinged. <laughs> yeah. Well, we sir, gotten... I hope we have done some work to bring back the reputation of this movie and to show just how thoughtful it is, together with how pleasant it is and how yeah, affecting. Yeah, it really is. And, no, it uh... really is. I, I think when you watch it, you know, it's... I remember watching it with somebody who hadn't seen many Westerns, and she said, I'm amazed that there was no violence in it hardly. <laughs> you know, yes. people are used to Westerns and gratuitous violence. And yet, Ford's Westerns, you don't ever hardly see any real violence. There's violence always in the background, but, you know, there's always violence everywhere. Yes. Sir, thank you okay. for yet another insightful conversation. And let's move on to another Western next time. I am especially <laughs> desirous of talking about Wagon Master, which I think is the least talked about. Yeah, and... you know, I haven't seen that one for a long time. For the sake of the audience, you're going to have to watch it again and let's have a conversation about it, sir. Sure. All right. Thanks okay. again. All the okay. best. We'll see you.